Now, with views you can trust and opinions you cannot ignore, the State of the Nation, next on Avaverna 24. The following program on Avaverna 24 is classified MA. It is intended for adults and may be unsuitable for children under 17. It may contain crude and decent language, explicit sexual activity, graphic violence, or political ideology. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. State of the Nation is an opinion-based program. The thoughts and opinions shared within this program are not intended to offend or disregard anyone's perspectives or beliefs. We aim to foster open dialogue, encourage critical thinking, and explore thought-provoking subjects. Recognizing the importance of diversity and inclusion, this program welcomes all viewpoints and cherishes the right to express them freely. This program also contains the opinions of the participants and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verna Media Network. The network believes in a safe space for all ideas to be expressed and on its duty to create such a platform for free speech. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. Tonight, in an historic election like no other, Sri Lankans have spoken and sent the national people's power to the highest office in the land. If there was confusion whether there was a resounding mandate from the presidential election, well, the citizens once again took to their hand to make it clear in the general election, giving the national people's power, power like no other, delivering the presidency and now the House with a two-thirds majority. Change is the theme and change they did. The electorate of this country is yearning for prosperity while rejecting all political parties that have governed this nation since independence. Sri Lankans have now placed their ultimate trust on the NPP to deliver. What lies ahead for them as they embark towards uncharted waters? Good evening, I'm Mahish Joni and this is the State of the Nation. Very good evening, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of the State of the Nation. Time, uh, the time is really right in order to check what is the State of the Nation. And uh, thank you for joining uh, with us. We took some time to get here, but uh, it's better late than never. So there is a lot more to discuss. What happened during the presidential election? What happened during the general election? Where is the country headed? Let's discuss all that. Well, today we stand at a pivotal moment in Sri Lanka's history. The recent elections have spoken volumes, loud and clear. The National People's Power Party has emerged with a mandate from the people, a mandate that signifies a deep-seated desire for change. The message is unmistakable. The citizens of this nation are yearning for a fresh start, placing their trust in the National People's Power to steer us towards a brighter future. Yet while we celebrate this shift, let us temper our enthusiasm with caution. It's essential that we don't slip into blind optimism. Change is a double-edged sword, and with it comes the responsibility to voice our concerns when errors arise. We must hold our leaders accountable, guiding them gently but firmly on the right path. This government may lack experience, but perhaps that is the silver lining in this scenario. Fresh perspectives can ignite innovation and sometimes the absence of traditional politics can result in the very change we've been craving for. With this electoral verdict, if done right, Sri Lanka is on the cusp of real growth and renewal. We must respect the will of the people even when it diverges from our personal beliefs. Our disagreement should not overshadow the importance of unity during this transformative phase. For if this government falters, the implications for our nation could be dire. We owe it to ourselves and future generations to ensure that we support this journey towards progress 
while remaining vigilant and engaged. The fate of our beloved nation rests in our hands. Let's make it a future worth fighting for. Let's take a short commercial break. We'll be right country to back-to-back -back elections, major elections that completely uh, changed the course of this nation. A party that only gained 3% in the previous elections and for, for quite some time, uh, who never had the ability to see this particular moment happen in the past, was uh, brought to power by the people. The people's mandate in the presidential election, if it was not clear, well, they made it very loud and clear in the parliamentary elections. A two-thirds majority for one single party has never happened for quite some, I, I, I have some uh, uh, experts here with me and we will get down into that. Uh, and it is a monumental uh, victory at this moment. Again, quoting Spider-Man, with great responsibility, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. So this is what we want to talk about right now and figure out exactly where is this country heading? What kind of challenges awaits us as we move on? And how we can uh, spearhead through them and not fall into the same pit holes that we fell prior. Joining me tonight is uh, Dr. Nalaka Godaheva, former parliamentarian, former minister. Uh, this time didn't contest and um, sitting very um, in the middle, I believe. Very relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And also Mr. Mohan Samranayak, a veteran um, uh, journalist and also um, our former uh, DG of the Information Department. Welcome back to the program, both of you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, let me start with you, Doctor. How do you analyze these two elections, uh, per se, back-to-back -back elections? People have chosen and the verdict is very loud and clear. Mm. Actually, people have spoken. There's no question about that. I would like to qualify that by saying the floating voters have spoken. Because if you really look at the 2019 Gotabe's mandate and uh, the current parliamentary mandate, not the presidential mandate, the current parliamentary mandate, it is exactly the same. Hmm. If you look at the numbers, uh, you can clearly see 6 million plus uh, voters have who voted for Gotabe Rajapaksha then have voted for uh, NPP this time. When Gotabe won, NPP got uh, uh, 400,000 plus votes. The famous 3%. Yeah, yeah, famous 3%. This time when NPP wins, Pohutua gets 3%. So the rest has, rest has switched. So basically the floating voters have uh, uh, switched. But in any case, I think it's an opportunity. Exactly. Because a very clear majority, uh, there's no way the government can now uh, say that, you know, we have to struggle to pass any act or whatever. They can, uh, they can even do a constitutional change. So as you very correctly said, Mahesh, uh, uh, with uh, great power comes great responsibility. Spider-Man. Yeah. <laughs> now, now, now it is up to the government to deliver because people are having a lot of expectations, a uh, lot of high hopes. And they're innocent people, genuine people who love the country. Uh, so they are in this situation today because the previous governments perhaps did not fulfill those expectations. And I sincerely hope the current government will put their best uh, foot forward and try to deliver. Uh, indeed, I want to get into those uh, previous government's uh, failures as well because uh, monumental tasks were done by you, uh, you as a minister in the previous government. But then again, we saw the rift uh, as, as things were moving ahead. Uh, Mr. Samaranaika, how do you analyze this particular verdict by the people? Uh, how do you see, um, I mean, for me personally, in my opinion, I see that people were fed up. They were fed up with this two-party system that was going for the past 75, 80 years, and they were fed up because none of them were delivering. They give 
lavish speeches, very articulating speeches during election campaigns, but never deliver when it comes to that particular uh, point. Excuses, excuses, excuses and excuses have basically put the voter to a position, back cornered them to a position. Uh, they had no other option but to go this way. Uh, just like what doctor said, uh, they are honest people and, and the floating vote from 6.9, 6.9 uh, now it has gone to 6.8 and the 3% switch also has uh, occurred from the party that got the majority in 2019. So in a situation like that, how do you see this verdict by the people? Okay, first about the people's verdict. It comes to my mind after the victory of the Chinese Revolution in 1949, Mao said, said Ch finally Chinese people have stood up. I would say Sri Lankan people have spoken. It is very clear mandate. There are many electoral firsts, unprecedented. Yes. Really, it is exceeding two third uh, majority. Yeah. Just to ask you, has it happened in the past? Never. No, this is the first time after the introduction of the 1978 con um, constitution. There was occasions when parties got two thirds, but this is the first time that be going beyond the beyond two thirds. A single La uh, party. Yes, single party. Now, if you take last time, Podujana uh, Paramana, it received 145. But within that po political formations, there were several other subgroups. But this is the one si or single political party. Now, I would like to um, touch upon something different, Mahesh, if you give me a little time. During the political discourse surrounding both the presidential election and the parliamentary election, the whole discourse was concentrated on two, I be, I co would, what I would call two very big fallacies. First is the unprecedented economic crisis that we uh, underwent recently. The, or, or perhaps the sole cause is corruption. Horror, horror. That was the, and the other fallacy is that since independence, in 1948, nothing has happened. What has happened was only theft, robbing people of their money. Uh, I would like to walk back to 1992 presidential election campaign in the United States, at the end of which Bill Clinton was made president. Bill Clinton's campaign strategist, his name is James Carvey. Mm -hmm. He oh, yeah. placed a there. term. <laughs> the term was, it is the economy stupid. Later it uh, spread to other areas as well. I believe in my country, in our country, it is the economy stupid. But we didn't analyze it and di we didn't discuss it uh, enough. That's for the moment, uh, uh, we can go ahead. <laughs> uh, uh, indeed, a uh, lot more to discuss, uh, yeah. Mr. Samaranaik. Uh, doctor, uh, now these trends which are grappling the water mentality in, in Sri Lanka, now, this has happened for the past three presidential elections. 2015 also, there were really good buzzwords, good campaigns that ran across. Uh, that got the, the party, elect, uh, party elected uh, but couldn't deliver. Same thing happened in 2019. A massive momentum uh, that actually came towards uh, former President Gotabe Rajapaksa, uh, which you were a part of that uh, cabinet as well. In a situation like that, what exactly happened? Because when people deliver, you ask the people. Now, I, I remember President uh, Gotabe Rajapaksa was asking, uh, give me the two-thirds majority because I want to do certain things, A, B, C, D. He was explaining it very clearly. The people delivered. You ask the people, people did their part. But then once it's given, what, ha what happens in this system? Is there a problem with the system? Because three consecutive governments couldn't get things done despite the fact that 
poli what politicians have been uh, asking from the people is delivered by the people. Mahesh, I think um, what happened what happened is um, these political parties who came to power in the past never understood why they got the, that mandate because always there's some theme that everybody speaks about people come and uh, vote but as I said earlier in my in the first round these are floating voters who are looking for something they are also not very clear what they want but they want a good country better country a better system they are unable to express that they are expecting the political party to deliver that ultimate goal so the same voters went and voted for Yahapalna government voted for Mahindra Rajapaksha before that then voted for Gotabia and now to NPP but Every time, every time when that happened, those political parties misunderstood that the fact that these are not their votes, voters. These are floating voters. They never understood that. Mahindra Rajapaksha thought that is Mahindra Rajapaksha's votes. Gotabe Rajapaksha interestingly thought again that it is Mahindra Rajapaksha's votes. He never thought it's his votes. He thought it is Mahindra Rajapaksha's votes. So then when they misunderstand like that, they can't deliver. Take Gotabe Rajapaksha's example. Now, I was a main campaigner for yeah, Gotabe yeah, Rajapaksha. Yeah, yeah. You know? So, when uh, we built Vyatmaga first, tried hard, brought the professionals, so many different organizations came to build uh, the profile of Gotabe Rajapaksha. Yeah. And we created a personality that people looked up to and believed be, believe that will make a change. So, people went and 6.9 million people voted for him. And Gotabe Rajapaksha misunderstood that. He thought that it's a vote for Mahindra Rajapaksha and Mahindra Rajapaksha policies and Mahindra Rajapaksha family. So then he brought the political strategist Basil Rajapaksha into the picture, the family into the picture, and st they, sta they started controlling the setup. And that's not what people wanted. People wanted Gotabe Rajapaksha to do a change, do a system change. And that was not delivered. That is why people got fed up. So that happened. At every election, the ruling party misunderstood this mandate. Now, I sincerely hope NPP will not do the same mistake. Now, if what, what are the pitfalls that that is immediately there for them to fall with such a big responsibility and such a big power that is being handed over right now? You no, know, first thing, first thing is uh, making the same mistake that the previous government did. That this is a vote for the party. This is not a vote for NPP. This is a vote for some result that people are, are you, looking are forward to. Are you telling to. that no longer there are camps? I'm pretty sure now it's a huge base of floating voters. They switched several times over the last 10 years. They will switch again if this government does not deliver. So this government has to understand what people want and deliver that. If they don't do that, this popularity, this hype, everything, will be gone in next to no time. Uh, Mr. Samarayaka, uh, I'm picking on that uh, uh, particular event, uh, the uh, particular point uh, doctor said, no more political camps anymore. People want to freely exercise their franchise, not saying that I am uh, a conservative, I'm a liberal, I'm a centrist, none of that. Is that, is that where this country's political future is headed? There are camps composed of a small uh, population. But generally, as Dr. Godeva said, uh, let's go back to 1994 when President Chandrika Kumar became president. The same thing happened. It was repeated every time. David Chandrika. It was repeated every time. Uh, in 1994 presidential election, Ms. Ba uh, Kumar Tunga received a 62% uh, yep. mandate. So likewise, later at every election, the same was uh, repeated. But m m what I say, uh, wh what I believe is the failure of the, of the government's, previous government is that they lacked a proper, well thought out political and economic mission, ideology, and a program, well-prepared program based on that. Now, for example, uh, for President Rajapaksa, I also appeared on his stages 
sometimes along with Dr. Godet Hebat. He had this uh, election mani manifesto, but he didn't have any blueprint to implement this manifesto. He didn't have a blue blueprint. That is what happened for every each government, as I see. Even Do you see the same thing happening now? That we have to wait and see. <laughs> it is yet to be seen. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, that, that, uh, what I said last time was uh, the entire election campaign was based on uh, uh, those two fallacies, as I said before. Not th they didn't uh, present it with the people what their election uh, economic program is. In my view, my one may not believe the major problem, basic problem that we are confronting with is this externally imposed neoliberal economic model. During this campaign, none of the political parties, minus when I say none, I mean none, none of the political formation spoke about this neoliberal mm, uh, economic model and also uh, equally crucial matter is the external pressures that we are facing. Nobody talks. Nobody speaks about it. Uh, Dr. Godeheva, in a situation like that, where people no longer have allegiance to one particular ideology, one particular formation of a party, one particular uh, a candidate, and they keep switching, how can we uh, safeguard the sovereignty and the national integrity of this country, which we call Sri Lanka, which is our home. And how can we keep, because uh, right now Philippines comes to mind, where in their particular uh, uh, mm, political scenario, all countries, a lot of uh, uh, influence from various other governments came and infiltrated. And now you have, you, most of Philippines uh, uh, nationals do not know where they yeah. aligned with that that has happened so in a situation like that how do you see how can Sri Lanka safeguard Sri Lanka and yet be part of this modern world I think the important thing is the government must be very clear what its policies is no that's what uh, yeah. my friend Mohan is also it's saying no? very brief it's intervention we cannot expect people to come up with that uh, particular yeah. ideology yeah. it is the rulers yeah. right. so right. the party must then now that now that NPP is in power NPP has to be clear as to what their policies are. Of course, they have published a very uh, well articulated, very nice manifesto. But if you, uh, you really? really look at it, I have read it. It is somewhat general. It's a kind of generalized thing, not not specific. So we have to see how the specifics are going to be put in place as they govern. No? But at the end of the day, Mahesh, I believe if the, if the government is strong and if the people are with the government, the sovereignty will always be protected unless the government goes and opens up uh, unnecessarily. I think government can uh, stand on its own because nobody is going to interfere into a government who have who the people's mandate. When, when, when foreign forces want to influence a country, the first thing they do, they destabilize the government and you know create problems here and there, like all those what we saw with uh, the, what happened in Arabian nations, etc. When people's mandate is not there, government is not strong, then you can interfere. Now here, you have a very strong government, very strong, very powerful mandate. So if the government is clear as to what they want to stand for, it is not going to be a problem. Indeed, uh, a lot more to discuss uh, with uh, my two guests, uh, Dr. Nalika Gudeheva, a former parliamentarian and also a former minister, and also uh, Mr. Mohan Samaranayaka, a veteran journalist uh, in this country, uh, worked in many uh, television uh, networks uh, and also uh, wrote a plethora of uh, articles uh, with regard to Sri Lanka's political situation. Uh, let's take a short commercial break. Uh, you're watching State of the Nation. We'll be right back.
Welcome back everyone to State of the Nation. Uh, I'm in conversation with Dr. Nala Gagodeheva, former minister and also former parliamentarian. And uh, with me also tonight is uh, Sir Mohan Samaranayaka, veteran journalist uh, um, and also the former uh, DG of the Information Department. Uh, let me start with you, uh, Mr. Samaranayaka, with regard to what you said earlier, with re uh, the economy. Uh, economy is the crucial factor in this year's election. And one of the arguments that was brought by former president Rani Vikramasinghe was, I stabilized this country. There was a crisis in 2022. I, was, I came to power and I stabilized it. So now give me power for the next five years in order to take this economic plan to the next level. People did not believe that. People didn't want to believe that. And then they chose a, a, a leader who basically has no govern, uh, governing experience, no a team that has the governing experience. Um, why was that message about the economy uh, was not resonating? And where did things start to go wrong for former government, especially the 2019-24 uh, government? Yeah. Uh, let's go again go back to the past. During the 1965-70 government headed by Dadis and Nayaka towards the end of the, their tenure, they invited a team from ILO to look into Sri Lanka's unemployment problem uh, and to get their recommendations. They produced a huge report in which they say Sri Lanka's major sources of foreign exchange was similar to uh, what was in 1945, even in 1968. So what does, that, what does that mean? We didn't have a consistent economic policy or program to develop our own economy, the production economy. Now we have come to a stage where production e economy is uh, being called as a uh, myth Mahesh. In one of your programs, there in a, I think Hyde Park, the present uh, central bank's governor, he very clearly said, production economy is a myth. So that that is the economic thinking. During the last two elections, presidential and parliamentary, this matter was not discussed not even touched upon yeah, as yeah. I believe, not even uh, touched upon. The unprecedented economic crisis that we experienced in 2022 is the cumulative result of several factors, not one single factor. It is not due to robbery, not due to fraud, and not, not solely due to corruption. It, uh, if I am to list few of the uh, factors in my view, one is the we inherited a co uh, an economy from colonial rulers, which was built to suit their own interest, not our interest. We maintained that for decades, and if, uh, and after 1977, we adopted an, econ an economic model imposed upon us by the powerful, which I would call hegemonic countries. These same countries were behind, I, in my view, uh, the so-called Aragale that unfolded during the first six months of 2022. There are uh, now evidence are coming up uh, recently, uh, to about one or two weeks before Sun Sunday Times in its political column very clearly said the present U.S. Ambassador in Colombo has gone to the extent of suggesting the successor of the Gota Bear Rajapaksha. This reminds me what happened in Ukraine in 2014. Uh, similar people were involved in that as well. I think Victoria Nuland is the uh, yeah. person who was there in the Ukraine issue uh, and she was very much involved. Just in give it. me a few minutes. During the Ukrainian color revolution, Victoria Nolan had a telephone conversation with the then U.S. Yeah. ambassador in Kiev, during which she said, who is to be yeah, named? Yeah. We played she, that clip yes, on this yes, program. She, she said, yet 
is the guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, doctor, do you agree with regard to the mistakes uh, that uh, that has happened uh, in, by the previous elections uh, that actually led, led to this particular crisis? Because right now, one of the things that you really need to understand is the fact that uh, people are fed up. And also, people have been pushed to a corner where they don't know what to do. Somebody comes and promises the uh, earth, sun, and the stars, they go with it. And, and that is a, a, a very bad precedent as well because they do not think that can these people uh, or whoever is coming can deliver what they are promising. They don't think about that. That's why I asked prior also. Uh, when a president who came and who did certain things in order to stabilize the economy was rejected and the people went with a, 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 a president who doesn't have any experience in governing, and also a team that doesn't have any experience in governing. What is the reason do you think that they were pushed to this level uh, of desperation to choose, saying, very sorry, we are no longer believing what you guys are saying, and we are going with this? I think very clearly what has happened, people have lost faith in the leaders, particularly the traditional leadership. Uh, so however much you try to explain a manifesto, people don't believe that they are going to deliver. because. Again and again we have seen governments coming into power, showing some yeah, nice yeah. manifestos and not delivering. So this time even though, in my personal opinion also, the biggest crisis the country has at the moment is economy. It was the economy, it is the economy, it will be the economy. Uh, people didn't want to look at the economic policies of the people. People wanted to try out somebody who will be faithful to them, who will not lie to them because they believe that everybody else has lied and fooled, take, them. fooled them. So, um, unfortunately, this time, as a result, economy was not the key issue for people. People looked at, more than anything, um, corruption as the core issue for the economic problems. Yes, corruption is an issue, but corruption is not the only issue. The, the, the economy is something far more complicated than that. And if you want to get out of this economic crisis, there are so many things that you need to do within whatever your economic policy is going to be. But people have narrowed it down simply to corruption and think, okay, if you form a government which is not corrupt, everything is going to be okay, which is very good. You need a, you need a government which is uh, not corrupt, corruption free, but there are so many other things that you have to Tell do. Tell me a country that has a corruption-free government. I, 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 I don't, I don't is, know of any, any such country. There is no corruption-free government in the country. So what people are saying is reduce the corruption. Reduce. You can manage it, control it, but you, it is very difficult to eradicate it. Huh? It has been there right yeah. from the beginning of the Even in China, history. people are executed, yeah. leaders yeah. are executed, yeah. on and off executed. for corruption. No? So, so that's that. So, so that, that does not mean that you know you the, have to what, leave what it. What you're saying is that it, this, what people really want to see is a mechanism of accountability, right? Because that is what, like, if you take Singapore, recently we saw one minister uh, uh, taking a bribe yeah. or, or seems to have taken a bribe mm -hmm. and in a situation like that the political system the judicial system and, and and the entire social justice system came into play and things fell into place he was taken to courts he was found guilty and and rigorous imprisonment all that was delivered that doesn't happen in this country people are not held accountable what people are really asking is yeah. not about the reduction of corruption, but more or less a mechanism of accountability that actually holds the correct people uh, who do these kinds of uh, errors accountable uh, for their injustice. Isn't that, Doctor? No, you're, 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 you're absolutely right. I must qualify what I said earlier. When I said people looked at corruption as the main issue, uh, that does not mean that you know they, they were wrong. Yeah. They're yeah. right. They're right. I mean, if you, if you look at the the Sri Lankan system that we have faced, corruption was one of the main issues why we couldn't come out of this situation. But we must understand corruption is everywhere. Corruption is not only with the politicians, even though during the election campaign, politicians are continuously blamed, rightly so. Yeah. Uh, it is The corruption is everywhere. In the government service, in corruption the is there. Sector. In the private sector, corruption is there. Everybody has some kind of contribution to the system. So the whole attitude has to be changed. And as Mohan uh, very correctly mentioned, 
I also don't know of any corruption free country. But you can minimize that. Yeah. So I think we come back to the reality, the current situation, the current government has given a strong promise that they will fight corruption and they should do. We sincerely hope they will succeed in that. But on top of that, what I'm saying is they have to get their economic policy right. They need to understand what uh, keeps us poor, what prevents us from yeah. developing, what growth strategies we need. And that is where the attention has to come. Why is fighting corruption? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Samaranayanka, with regard to geopolitics, which is a very crucial element when it comes to any kind of uh, countries, we've seen um, you know, how you United States interfere in elections, in many, uh, especially in Latin American countries. There are evidence of that. Uh, and also how other countries influence certain p political parties within those uh, nations in order to act in such a manner so that they can uh, get what they want. This particular, whenever we bring this, you know, topic, how it is being silenced is by bringing this word saying, oh, this is basically what people are uh, saying because it now has become a negative thing to talk about. They don't want to talk about it, but that is the reality of yeah. things. So, Sri Lanka is a hot pot, hot podge of a, a, a geopolitical, uh, a, I think, okay. a nightmare. I mm. would say, yeah. uh, one side, United States, is very interested oh. in, in in Sri Lanka. Hopefully, with uh, a Trump presidency, I, I hope it will go back into the uh, not being the case. Um, Europe is also very much interested, uh, particularly the United Kingdom. And then uh, on the other side, China, Russia. All this country wants a, a little bit of a, a slice from this country called Sri Lanka. Yeah. Do you think the current administration can handle the pressures of geopolitics which will definitely shape up their future policies and help make them, because they can't shut the world, they have to work with the world. So in a situation like that, how do you see us moving forward? Because we need foreign investors. We can't just say, you know, geopolitics and ask them not to come here. That can't happen. But how, what, what is the balancing act? Yeah. Yes, that cannot happen. We have to understand the reality first. While we strive to build a strong economy, we have to be uh, aware of the dangers that we are facing at the same time. The, one of the danger is these geopolitical pressures, extensive, intensive pressures. Uh, I, w I would like to give a few examples. Just six months after the end of the war in this country with LTTE in December 2009, US uh, Foreign Relations Committee prepared a report on Sri Lanka. Its title was Sri Lanka semicolon recharting US strategy after the war. In its introduction, it says the United States cannot afford to lose Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. That has been there. There were several other policy strategic papers after that, that where they emphasized, stressed the importance of the geopolitical um, geopolitical importance of the Sri Lanka of Sri Lanka's locations uh, during President Rajapaksa's time he initiated some maritime dialogue called goal dialogue at in one of the goal dialogue uh, meetings the guest speaker was Admiral Harry Harris then he was the head of U.S. Indo-Pacific fleet. During his delivery, he said, Sri Lanka is truly the gem in the Indian Ocean. And, uh, and he added, the uh, strategical importance, significance of a country depends on three factors. One, location. Two, location. Yes. Three, location. That is this. how they... Now, if the current U.S. ambassador in Sri Lanka, when she was nominated for this post, while talking to the US Senate committee, she said, I will work hard to keep Sri Lanka within the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. Absolutely. So th that is how we are affected by external pressures. This is not to invent and propagate 
conspiracy theories to forget other harsh realities in the country we have to strive to build a strong economy while taking into consideration those dangers but at the uh, moment i believe it is uh, it is going to be a very painful exercise it is going to be a very very painful exercise uh, depending uh, considering the latest evidence that we are receiving from various quarters doctor um you're running out of time i want to talk about a little bit of the errors that occurred in the previous government you were part of that government and now you are free. you're a free agent now you can <laughs> speak freely but what i really want to understand is what started what was the starting point where things started to go wrong in that government um, because we saw a president who was very uh, vigorous in in as a defense secretary completely uh, uh you know uh, in front of our eyes disappearing into this statesman who we couldn't even recognize because he was more interested in being very politically correct is that uh, that would be the word so things were not addressed when it was supposed to be addressed wrong people were put into the wrong positions i mean let's talk about you your economics um, uh, you have a very uh, economic oriented background and you started doing water water management or something so th- in a situation like that how what kind of advice can you give the uh, incoming uh, administration to make sure that you they also don't fall into the same pitfall because we can't keep this repeating every single administration and within 2 3 years people started saying uh, you know uttering the words go home see <clears throat> gota be rajapaksh in my opinion uh, got the same mandate the current uh, president yeah. has got as i said earlier 6 million plus people went and voted for him looking for a system change the system change what they were looking for primarily was to come by change in the leadership they expected a, a professional cabinet uh, strategic management focus on key issues etc etc the starting point was the people but mr gotabe rajapaksa once they became the president to some extent became a slave of the party which he shouldn't have been he started listening to the family and look at the look at his first cabinet i don't think it is that cabinet the people wanted people wanted new faces people wanted freshness but after the general election he went and appointed all seniors and he in fact in fact, in fact told me once that you know basil rajapaksha wants seniors in that but people didn't vote for basil rajapaksha people voted for Gotabe Rajapaksa's presidency and expected Gotabe to be tough and deliver. So he got it wrong there itself. Then uh, there were there were people during the, poll, the election campaign advising him. So he was he, he he was guided by a team. When he left the team aside and started working with his family and to some extent alone, he lost that wisdom that could have helped him. so the, the the country's priorities were forgotten what was the priority even, even when he came to power 2019 we knew as economists that there was a crisis brewing hmm. particularly balance of uh, payment crisis and i don't think by putting all of us aside and trying to work with few individuals he understood the problem was there for the first two years his focus was elsewhere that yes. the first two years of was the time that you would have actually applied so, solutions applied solutions for this economic crisis that, that was brewing of course covid he had to fight there there was no option but then he switched his attention to fertilizer issue which was totally un, uncalled for right and nobody nobody wanted him to go and uh, convert, the, convert the country to organic uh, fertilizer in one year even in the manifesto it was clearly stated as a 10 year plan but he his, his mind was on that he forgot he, he left the economy to a few individuals and those individuals i think didn't brief him properly and that is why a lot of things went wrong if not for the balance of payment crisis the aragale could have uh, yeah. surfaced no because people would have never come to that particular position they were pushed to that position that was the That's reality it. of it um uh, mr samaranaika i want to talk about the sri lanka podujana peramuna or the parties that stood for the for, for 
um, this concept of nationalism and, and uh, um, the Jati Katwe uh, camp. What has happened to them? Because in this election, people rejected them. There was no party that gained power, or at least the second, the third, were on that particular platform because that particular concept is now labeled as racism and no longer can be talked about, which is a dangerous precedent as well. Uh, so what has happened to them and how can they revive themselves? Some uh, people interpret nationalism as uh, chauvinism or racism. Uh, I recently I saw in one of the uh, paper articles appeared in the English press quoting Albert Einstein saying nationalism is an infantile disease. It is the measles of the world. But nationalism mm -hmm. can, cannot be interpreted in such a manner because it depends on the circumstances available in a particular country. In our country when we say nationalism is we have to be free, independent, we have to have our own economy which is uh, integrated to the global economy on our terms, not on other uh, uh, the terms and conditions of uh, hegemonic powers. That we did not understand. We did not uh, adopted in our policies. My view is that Podujana Paramuna leadership really were not uh, interested in nationalism. It is the people who supported this uh, political formation were nationalistic. The Aragalaya, which I call a regime change a revolution, color revolution, was aimed at dispersing these nationalistic forces who supported both uh, Gotabaya Rajapaksha and Mahindra Rajapaksha. That is what they wanted. But I think they, are, they have uh, reached their target. They have achieved their target. Now the nationalist forces are in total disarray. I don't know how long will, will it will take to unite them, get together them. <coughs> So in, we are in such a dangerous situation. Uh, Dr. Nahalaga Guneva, I'll give you the la last word um, with regard to this particular subject of Sri Lanka being Sri Lanka. Is the old way of uh, doing things is done and rusted? Or are you know, people want a new thing or are we being told that we need a new thing and never go back into the old ways of doing things? See. Uh, what is something that is unique about mandate this time is that the entire country has voted more or less the same way. No, that is unique. We have to we have to accept that reality. It is not only the Sinhalese people or the southern uh, vote. Uh, even in Jaffna, uh, people have uh, switched their thinking patterns. So no longer this separatist uh, uh, political thinking seem to be acceptable to the people. So I think it's as a golden opportunity. Yeah to put things in the right path. Which so, is one Sri Lanka. One Sri Lanka and also the, 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 the YIS is a golden opportunity. The current government can change the constitution. They don't have to struggle to do that. So, but if, if they get their uh, ideology right, uh, they have an opportunity to do a constitutional change and maybe take us in, the, in a different path with the blessings of everybody not only the southern people, but the northern as well. If I am not wrong, this is the first time. Yeah. yeah. No, no, that's, uh, that's one of the things that uh, was beautiful about this uh, mandate is the fact that everyone, every party, I think Sri Lanka became united by this particular mandate. Mm -hmm. um, we no longer can talk about, uh, you know, uh, there is separatism in Sri Lanka, this argument about uh, you know, pe people treating uh, um, various ethnicities in a different manner. That has gone out of the window and it should be actually put back in the back burner of things because right now it was the uh, people from the north elected a Sinhala leader because he won that. And the so-called separatist parties were put, uh, were given not, not a mandate, they, they, they were given a clear verdict saying we, we are also done with your BS. Uh, Dr. Nalak Gudheva and uh, Mr. Mohan Samar I appreciate your time and being here. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, you coming on the show and um, talking to us and dissecting this uh, situation where 
uh, the current uh, administration, uh, if a new administration that is going to come in tomorrow, there's going to be a new cabinet being sworn in, 25 members. Let's wait and see and hope for the best. Uh, and like Dr. Godeheva said, it is a golden opportunity for all of us. Thank you for watching. This is State of the Nation. We'll be back again next week with another episode of the program. Thank you for watching. Good.